Good evening, everyone on the call. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invite and um, thanks for the opportunity to share something that I'm very passionate about. Um, apologies to everyone listening because <laughs> I'm caught up in a place where there's load shedding. Interesting. Um, I'm in a part of South Africa currently where the ESCOM is load shedded. And so uh, I'm sorry, it's kind of winter. It's like one degree outside and it's already dark. So apologies for not showing my face. Hopefully, if we're able to solve this in the near future, there won't be anything like this. So today I'll be speaking on energy access for all. And like I said, thanks for the opportunity. I'll try not to waste people's time. And then I would like to know how to hear people's um, opinion and questions at the end of everything. Most of the things I'm gonna be discussing are known facts for people that are in the industry. But I'm just going to find um, a way to present something different from what I've been talking about for quite a while. And hopefully we'll find it interesting. And hopefully this discussion bring out something that can inspire all of us to make something happen in our continent. So today I'm going to be speaking about state of energy in Africa and then the energy assets and its implications. I'm going to answer the question whether it's possible for there to be energy access to everyone in Africa. I'm going to bring out some, I'm going to present some challenges that we have found, you won't have seen in my experience and the ones that are out there. And I'm going to present some main driving force and then I'm going to infer some solutions and then we can have a discussion on how possible this is. So I want to speak about some fact checks. So I, I made, I intentionally made this, um, what do you call it? This uh, map, the map of Africa, I intentionally made it black because that's how I feel. And one thing we must know before I even go into the discussion is that urbanization in Sub-Saharan Africa is happening at a very high speed. And um, research shows that it's, it's gonna double in the next two decades. And that is something we need to plan for because before we didn't have electricity because it wasn't enough. But now there's industrialization, we are moving at the same pace as the world. If it was those days, uh, Africa, no one will have GSM yet in Africa. But at this rate, there's no development that starts anywhere in the world that doesn't come to Africa immediately. And because of this industrialization, there's going to be increase in energy demand. So energy demand in Africa is not just to light our bulbs or just to watch TV. We know that Africa is hot, so heating and cooling in Africa is another level compared to how it is. So our demand is going to be higher than what we were expecting. So we have a very young growing population, which is our strength. I hope we're able to maximize it. And you know, if there's snapshot anywhere in the world, Africa, we have started. We even go further than the people that invent these things. So at this stage, when we are preparing for energy access, we should think beyond lightening those rural areas. We should also think that, for example, in South Africa, when I first came to South Africa in 2014, there was never load shedding. I know they said there used to be one at a time, but this year has been hectic. So even those that think they do have, need to prepare for the expansion that is coming on. And that's why I said IT needs, data centers, storage, we're gonna look into it. And there, if we continue like this, we'll end up having nine out of 10 people in the world, which will be from Africa not having access. I will explain how I came about this number in the course of the discussion. Now, this is the state of energy in Africa. If you look at this map, um, different people are using different things because we are so blessed. I'll, I'll take us through how we're blessed. If you look at Nigeria in this part of the world, we have oil production, we have natural gas, a little of a hydro, whereas in South Africa, there's solar, there's hydro. And if you go to Kenya, you see geothermal, which is one of the best places to use in Africa, in, in the world, actually. So we are blessed. One will wonder why we're in the state we are. And look at these gears. Uh, if you know, I don't need to explain this, but if you are an engineer, you'd have understand. But if I want to explain to everyone, it just shows that you see, if these two moves like this, it will make this one moves like this and it will eventually drive this number three. So this is how life is supposed to be based on the resources that we have in Africa, if things were normal. However, this is what we see. 
you would have already seen, I'm just making an example of a gearbox. See, this gear is perfect, but the other one is not perfect. It's just showing an example of those who have resources and are not able to use it. Here I'm showing like African potential in renewable energy is enormous, but we have only been able to use like 10% or less than 10% of it. The same thing with our hydro resources, for example, Inga in Congo, very perfect location, the best spot for hydro in the world. Um, that project has been, has been in existence, I think, before I was born and <laughs> it's still never done till today. So we have the resources, but our gears are not turning each other in the right way. Uh, square pegs in, in round holes, something like that. That's why I make this analogy. So what are these things that we have? Interestingly, this is geothermal resources. We've got it plenty in Africa. I don't need to speak much about solar. You can see how red our continent is. This is biomass. The temperature of a continent determines how much biomass you're able to generate from the plant. And going forward, we'll have to prioritize renewable energy, but despite that we're prioritizing renewable energy, there's still gonna be a space for um, fossil fuel a bit because we are also, interestingly, we're also blessed in fossil fuel. So we are promoting like even if we're gonna use conventional, conventional kind of uh, energy source, we should use gas, which is the cleanest. Okay, let's go into the discussion. Now we've been speaking about energy assets. It's interesting and um, you'll be, you wonder what people, people will say like energy assets in Africa. If you don't really understand what I was saying, you say, what's energy assets? We know this is a known fact. I see 40 million people are without energy assets. To put it in context, um, to put this in context in Africa, there are 12 countries that 80% of their population have no access to energy. And when we say no access, it doesn't mean 100%. It's, uh, for example, my place in Nigeria, I always say it everywhere I go, like sometimes we don't get electricity in over two weeks. So when it comes, I, when they call me, they will just say there's electricity to warm the bulbs. So in South Sudan, there was a time they had 99% no access. Can you imagine only 1% have access to electricity and in Chad only 8%. So when we talk that this is a matter of emergency, it's a big deal. So imagine 8% having access, not to 100% energy. This electricity may be like eight hours a day, but the remaining 92 don't have access at all. So this, I was trying to relate this to hundreds of thousands of deaths that are caused in this process. So you can see here that wood burning itself in Africa, I was saying causes lung cancer, causes malfunction, causes chronic bronchitis and the rest of it. However, this wood burning you see here is not wood burning in Africa. This is foreign wood burning, international standard. This is what we say. And I'm sure every African can relate to this. Next, you all know that there has been so many operations in our hospitals that has been done with candles. Uh, we have incidents of people that have lost their life because of lack of electricity in the hospitals. So when we say energy is life, the people that call the name energy power, they know what they're saying. And we know that we are not able to compete with the world when it comes to innovation and educational attainment because you have to compromise. There are some experiments you can't run uh, because there's no 100% access to power. So it's a big deal. That's why I laid this foundation. Now, the question that we're here to answer today is, is energy access for all possible in Africa? Now, a research by LUT University, this is a known fact, but I mean, I needed to find a, a real, realistic source for it. it. Says like 70 billion euros, there about around $100 billion is going to power Africa using renewable energies. That is from today. Now, this is not a lot of money. To put it in context, this means if the 53 richest people in the world that own like $1.5 trillion, if they are able to contribute 6% of their wealth, <laughs> that means we can power Africa for you. And this means that the major problem we are having with our youth population is going to result in 6 million jobs. And these jobs was calculated in this research based on 40 years uh, kind of job, let's say 35. 
was from 2015 to now it's five years. So I, I use it in the context of 30 years. So we can make 6 million jobs in Africa from renewable energy. The current job rate in, in coal and fossil fuel in coal is 1.5 million. Another fossil fuel is around 3 million. So it's, it's higher jobs if it's done correctly. But if you see the mixture of everything, manufacturing, construction, and this job also entail temporary and permanent jobs. But over the years, we'll be able to make 6 million jobs available. Now, this $100 billion that I spoke about to make energy access available, I once spoke about this in the uh, presentation I did a few weeks ago, but I like to re-emphasize it. So I, I brought it in context. Uh, this $100 billion, uh, if we say we want to make it $10 billion annually in the next 10 years, say we want to electrify Africa in the next 10 years, yearly we put $10 billion. Or if you want to be aggressive, like I'm an aggressive person when it comes to um, fulfilling dreams, I would like to put $20 billion yearly. So that means we can achieve this in five years. So this 100 million connections means uh, six people per home. That's what I'm using to calculate this. So US defense budget is almost 60 billion every, a monthly defense budget is almost 60 billion. Annual budget for peacekeeping is not up, it's more than that. Beijing Olympics cost 40 billion. Why NASA's budget is more than 20 billion and all we need yearly for Africa is 20 billion. So it's not a rocket science, it's not something impossible. Now, not to talk much, I'm sure we all know all this. I'll just, after this, after this slide, I'll just bring out another dimension to this. So there's a lot of political leave services and favorable regulations and policies. In Nigeria, there's a law on battery that um, I think is 20% on battery, 10% of solar PV. Kenya has changed now. They're gonna be charging that on microgrid providers. South Africa and most African countries, you can't set up any generation plant that is more than one megawatt. I don't think there's anyone who has got a license, for example, in South Africa in the last few years to build a plant that is more than one megawatt. So what are we doing? If we really want to solve this problem, why do the government come out, speak so much English, go back, let the regulation work, it doesn't work. For example, in South Africa, the president came out and said, uh, the mines are gonna be allowed to have their own plants, which will relieve ESCOM and let the populace have access to electricity. Then another, the, the minister came out and said something different. So we don't know where the, what, where, what the challenges are. So it's a matter of national, I mean, continental emergency. If we see the problems I said, how it causes death, we may not take it serious, but it's a big deal. Taxes also, I've mentioned that. Utilities competition. Now, all the national utilities see renewable energy, for example, or new alternative energies as, as a challenge, as a competitor. But this is a known fact. You can't hold monopoly forever. In Germany, for example, there was a time where the German utility held on to the, to the networks so much. But now, I mean, they nearly have to beg people to connect to them because there are so many independent utilities that are going out. There are many people are even off grid, they are independent. And there's still subsidies for coal in Nigeria, there's subsidies for fossil fuel in many African countries, there's, there's subsidies for coal and fossil fuel. Now, how do new technology that doesn't have any subsidy compete? And we're glad that, that most of the renewable energy, including hydro, are cheaper than conventional fuels. Now, the major elephant in these challenges that has not been looked at a lot in Africa is transmission network. Uh, let me show you this. In transmission, this is how power works, I'm sure, for, for the benefit of people who may not be an expert in the field. There's power generation, so this could be either solar plants, nuclear plants, whichever plant it is. However, trans there's also transmission line where you have to carry that power from where it's generated to distributors. Distributors will be those people you pay that send energy back to you. So this transmission line is all in all African countries currently is in, the, excuse me, is in the hand of the government. So while we are all talking about build more solar plants, build more this, build more that, we are using very, very old transmission lines. As a matter of fact, the number of kilometers of transmission line in Africa, the whole of Africa is not up to the one in Brazil, the whole of African network. So 
I'll give an instance of Nigeria, the generation capacity is around 12 to 13 gig, but they are only able to evacuate five gig, which means they produce even more. You know, when Nigeria, for example, needs like 60 gig, or let me put it like that, let's say 30 gig for immediate takeoff, but they are only able to take out five. That's why they have 12. The same thing with many other African countries too. In Congo, it's the same. Um, that's where you start having issue of, they say overcapacity. You wonder when they say there's a country that is having overcapacity, but the people don't have electricity. So that's what I'm saying here that um, we need to put attention on transmission line because it creates access to cost effective sources of generation. For now, in most African countries, you build a very big plant, if it's not like microgrid or mini grid, you will have to build transmission line yourself or pay for it, which is huge. And this is the only way we can move forward because if all of us are going into building plants and the powers and the lines are not able to accommodate it, then we are still going to come back to square one. And this is a big deal, which I want to point our attention to. So for energy access to be possible, I've shown the numbers, I've shown how easy it is. If we take it serious, like if it's a national, we see it as a continental emergency and they will bring all hands of deck. We just need to fix the transmission lines too. And then, if you come three have over capacity, it's easy to transfer to the next country. So um, this is one of my ending slides, which is showing what are the main driving forces and solution. I said here that the cost of electricity, sun, wind are now cheaper. So we have to maximize it and we have to break it down, which I've mentioned about. Sometimes we may not have to compete with the grid, we just have to have individual plants because there are some places in Africa because the further you go into Africa, the more expensive it is to build new plants. So those ones may be able to operate on isolated or individual grid. So in the meantime, the cost of uh, battery is also going down. So PV, for example, I mean, with the rate that battery is going down, there's no way that any, any technology will be able to compete with it. Also, the growing price means that, I mean, the reduction in price means that we will have to close down our aged plants, coal plants at some point. But there are some things we need to note, like uh, it's not about just making electricity available. It's also about making quality electricity available and understanding the strategy. And that's why, for example, in Ghana, there was a time that a lot of IPPs were given generation licenses and then eventually Ghana find like, found out like they were too expensive. So Ghana, Ghanaians would prefer to import from Côte d'Ivoire than to buy from the local guys. So you see why we're saying uh, it's, not, it's not a rocket science, but it needs some strategic plan. You need to put the right people there to do it. Because now if we all say, everyone is saying solar, go solar, we'll go solar, and then we're not able to manage it, then what happens next? And we should always remember that we should prepare because Africa now, the way we're going, uh, the temperature here is different from the rest of the world. So when we plan, we need to plan rightly because be, if we have to be sustainable, we still have to work on food security, safety of food. So we need to know how we're going to build our silos that are able to be independent. So many things involved, but it all boils down to innovative ideas in making this thing work. And, and then lastly on this note will be innovative finance strategy. We know land is a big deal in Africa. You need to devise a mean where maybe there's going to be um, a, what do we call it? Um, free carry for the locals, or maybe you're going to start a trust fund for the locals so that there will be security of plants because some of these plants are built in very remote areas. People who don't have access to food that you just come and put solar panels in their area. So, you know, we have to devise a means for Africa in an African way. So that's why it's important, like I said, it's not a copy and paste from somewhere else in the world. So these are my next step so that I can allow access to questions. I said the political education is very important. The next thing is ESCO. These ESCOs, I mean, energy service companies for commercial and industrial, that's what I mean. Um, data and switch centers, you know now in Africa, not just in Africa, data is a big deal. And these data centers use huge amount of energy. This was not there before. So that's why you are seeing that every country is now having a reduced energy available for the populace. So now we need to have dedicated companies that will be servicing different sectors. So it's important for 
let's say telecommunication company to face their telecommunication telecommunication work or an IT company or data company to face their data or where this is where young people can come in. We are allowed to build our own energy service company and then we get contracts to manage the power for those places. So for example, the mast can be independent, you can form an upgrade for each mast for telecommunication company where you have the solar gen, if you even want to include gen, solar gen battery and you reduce the runtime of generator. Many have 70% of the mast, I think in Nigeria runs on diesel generator, all of them have diesel generator on sites. And the same goes on for most African country, Burundi, Congo, um, South Sudan. Some of them even have 100% generator. So we need to have energy servicing company, a lot of it with expert, such that the whole development of Africa can be wholesome. It won't be uh, the same IT companies are also the one managing their power. So it's very important because data and switch centers now are a big deal and they are ruling out and it's a lot of issues. So that's why I'm saying renewable energy company to, to power local businesses and then support them. Also agriculture, if you're going to mechanize agriculture, African Development Bank is big on agriculture. So it's very important for them also to consider developing um, ESCOs for agriculture so that there will be suppliers, energy suppliers, and that will take them off the national grid and reduce the tension. And I said here, we need to maximize our hydro potential. I said in one of the first slides that we are only using less than 10%. We have water, why not use it? Upgrade the transmission line, the way I've said it, unbundle the utilities. One of it is the transmission lines are always in the hand of the government. We can also privatize that or allow people to, to, to manage that. Build transmission line, get paid for electricity that is passed through it. That's what I mean by unbundle utility. And of course, removal of subsidies. Because why do we compete? You, I make my electricity and then I don't get any money from government where there's a technology in which the government pays them half of the money. So there's no fair competition in that. Uh, with this, I believe we can achieve 100% access. I wanted to make this more of interaction. So I didn't put too much slides and this will be the end of the discussion. So if you have any question, I'll be glad to answer. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, hello. Are we supposed to talk like via the chat or speak up? I'm not really sure. You can speak up. I think you can speak up. Okay. Okay, yes, I have a question. I just right. wonder if now is the time for renewables in Africa because the drive for renewables, the the what's what makes renewables profitable is regulation and the concerns for climate change. And then I think that we've not polluted as much as the rest of the world. And it's obvious that there is a direct correlation between carbon emission and development. It's very obvious that it's literally almost linear, the relationship. So why should we be burdened with concerns of climate change when we've not polluted as much as the rest of the world? This means that the impact for renewable energy, the cost of entry is very high. You speak of subsidizing, subsidizing conventional means of electricity generation by the government, and you speak of removing the subsidy, but don't forget who we're trying to subsidize for. Because the continent itself is, is poor in that sense. It's, that's why the government seeks to try to subsidize. So to remove that subsidy, to try to make renewables more profitable, more economical, it doesn't, I don't, but to me, it doesn't make, because for example, solar panels, the most efficient of them is 21% efficiency. You go to biomass, you, you're speaking of, of land issues. Why don't we focus on our, why do you think we should not focus on our, on our fossil fuel, techno, on our fossil fuel energy? Use already established technology so that the cost of entry is not high. Why, why do you think that is not the better, better part? That's All right. Thank you so much for your question. By the way, cost of entry of renewables is cheaper than fossil fuel as of now. One, two, at this stage, like I said, it's critical. We need, it's a matter of emergency. 
um, renewable energies can be built very fast. I mean, I've been part of a five megawatt that was built in six months. So whereas if you're gonna build nuclear plants, for example, it's gonna take years, that's two. Three, if you go to Kenya there's, and Zambia, there's so many mini grid companies. There's so many small, small, I can even mention names of few of them. Um, there's so many few um, companies that are doing well in the most rural area of Africa. You see, I was speaking of transmission line. If you've been to in Africa, there are some places that there's no even wire. You've never seen wire. There. And government are not gonna come there in the next few years, except they come to campaign. So renewable energies, when I speak about them, it's not just building a huge plant. There's also mini grid and micro grid. That, for example, Nigeria has identified over 3,000 sites for that. And there are a lot of guys that are working on that. And you'll be amazed they are billing cheaper than what uh, the government, the NEPA, PATN, or whatever is billing. There is a business principle, a business model, for example, in one of the companies in, I think in Zambia, I was part of it. Yes, Zambia, in South Zambia to be specific. They don't even let people pay energy costs. You subscribe, like based on whatever you have in your house. And I was shocked. The poorest of the poor were able to afford it because you know electricity is not cheap, but at the same time, the cost at which um, the money that is spent into uh, the what do you call it, subsidy for for fossil fuel is big. That money can be used for something else because now. I've seen tenders where you have 4.5 cents of solar energy. And even the subsidized amount of solar, of, I mean, of crude oil is not up to that in African countries. So you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's obvious, like we can do without fossil fuel. And then when you talk about those projects, and interestingly, they signed, they did everything possible. Then the government changed. The new government said, no. This, we can't take that amount that we signed. We need to review it. They reviewed it. They said no. So there's different lots of things there. So you want to wonder, like, do you really want this thing or you don't want it? That's one. So remember what I said, policy in terms of um, government keep changing what they decided to do. Number two, in terms of regulation. So even if you want us to register this plant, it's not a big deal. Just make the process transparent and easy. Because uh, what I see is people are not seeing energy as number one, for example, you see how African leaders shout when there is oil crisis. If we can compete, we can have the same energy put into power because we know Africans. I'm sure even you, Kenny, if you have access to 100%, for example, if you were in Africa, if you have access to 100% power, as a smart person, there's a million things you can achieve. So that's when we say government is not uh, dedicated to you. That's what we mean because, for example, now, in South Africa, there's been a call for, they said there's going to be bid window five, you come, you go, you different things. The government will say there's going to be an addendum for uh, new solar plants. Then you hear on the news again, it's now nuclear. Last two years in, in South Africa, nuclear was a no-go area. Two months ago, or last month, two months ago, rather, the government announced a bid for nuclear. So we don't know where we're going. And if you're an investor that you want to invest in Africa, you're not going to put your money in what is not sure. So that's what we mean. The plants are not there. If the plants are there, it's never followed. So that's what we mean by dedication. But if you are doing less than one megawatt in few African countries, yes, it's working. Here in South Africa, it works. I know many guys that are also doing it in Nigeria, it works. It works in Kenya and it also works in Zambia. But that means our progress is going to be slow. And remember, each year we are having more energy demand. We don't know what will happen next year. This year now is work at home. So which means there's more demand, there's more need for internet, so there's more need for power for data centers. This was not the case last year. So it's, it's, it's a huge challenge on our part. So that's what I mean when I say government's issue. Okay, all right. Thank you much, uh, Dr. Teosi. Yeah, because like I said, I'm just, I'm not an expert, but since I was, you know, I was in, let me say, undergrad, I've been enthusiastic like how can a country let's say for example usa with their population with their land mass power you know all every building you know 24 7 but here here we are in africa we can't do it so i've always been looking forward to you know, have you know being in webinars seminars and but it looks like the government has always been a bottleneck not only in power 
even in a lot of things, for example, in, uh, uh, sorry, I'm digressing a little bit. You, you just heard this morning that the CEO of the go -Kart that was just you know, uh, killed in Manhattan. Why? Because the business failed back here in Africa. People in that ecosystem are actually saying it's actually linked to the fact that investors' money were linked. But what I'm trying to drive at is that the, the government has been a bottleneck in the progress of Africa. Do we have alternative means as can we, you know, I don't know, I don't want to use the word think outside of the box. Is it possible for us to still, to an extent, increase, you know, energy access in Africa from the entrepreneurial side now without the government? So yeah, that's my question. I just, you know, that's just the way I'm thinking. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. I didn't know I was on mute. Um, straight up answer to that is simple. That's what I do for a living. Focus on energy supply that is less than one megawatt. Simple. So as long as you, you stay in that range, the money may be small, but little by little, one step by time, you'll be happy you are fulfilling your dreams. So far, you are playing in that zone of less than one megawatt. At least, um, most banks, for example, take less than one megawatt on their roof, which is fine. So, and most homes, for example, is five kilowatts to seven kilowatts. So, and most shopping centers in Africa, if it's not too big, they can take less than one megawatt, at least take off some of their bills. So that's the way forward. Okay, um, good evening. Uh, my name is um, Collins. I want to uh, thank Dr. Tuyasi, my good friend, uh, for this uh, lecture. Um, I just have a little, a little contribution, I would say. I, I think the major problem we are having, I'm going to agree with uh, Kenny Adams when he said, uh, I think the government is, is our biggest problem. Now, um, the lack of willpower and sincerity of purpose of our government, of the government in Africa, is a major problem that we are um, having, especially in Nigeria. Now, the, now, once we uh, we all know what power, how what power is all about, and once we are able to have power and in a stable form, the level of productivity will always be increased. That is what I have always. If I, I, I see different countries. Okay, um, right now I'm in the United Arab Emirates. I see what they do here. Of course, like um, uh, Dr. Toyosi said. He, he mentioned the uh, countries ut utilizing what they have to produce what they need uh, in terms of energy. Now, uh, Dubai, of course, they have the sun. Uh, today, it was up to for, for the 44 degrees, uh, uh, 44 degrees in the, uh, in the afternoon. Now, it's, it has just gone down to 39. Now, it, it, they are harnessing this for generation of power. Now, uh, he talked about mm -hmm. uh, what um, Kenya they are doing and all that. And these, are, these are the things. And I feel that... Um, once there's a smooth operation from government, okay, these things are easy. It's not rocket science. These are things that can be done. But I just feel that they, uh, there's a lack of uh, sincerity because I, 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 I've come to discover that when you have government officials who are just there, they have everything at their back and they have everything that they need. Uh, they can generate their own electricity for their, for, their, for their houses. They can generate power. Anything they want to do, they have it for themselves. They don't care about who has and who doesn't have and all that. Well, uh, the minds to generate this, to, to you know, to bring about, uh, uh, to develop um, ideas that can be that can be beneficial. We all we have them in Africa. We have we the brain. I, I always say we're the brain center or uh, the nerve center of the world. When you talk about when you talk about in uh, a capacity and uh, a capacity building. So I think the government. Uh, if there's a way, this you know, I don't know how their priorities really. Like someone, uh, someone was talking about uh, uh, when it comes to crude oil, especially a special uh, emphasis on Nigeria. When it comes to crude oil, the way they respond because they have it that this is an already made, this is something already made. So we're not losing any sleep and it's okay. Let's just focus our attention there. It's just it's a cash cow who can just okay, always get money from it. But they're not ready to look at other sectors. To, uh, to develop other sectors, to uh, give us this power that we so desire in Africa, and uh, I just, I just hope that uh, we're going to get this right. That's my little contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Collins. I'm good to hear.
Thank you so much, Collins. I'm good to hear your voice. Um, is there any other um, question or is there any other question from Facebook, um, Africa by us? No, there isn't. There isn't. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kutoyos, can I still ask more questions? Uh, you can just make it snap. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've been wondering why, you know, uh, China is, is, has become an industrial base for some of these things. Before I left Nigeria, I did a little bit of training in uh, solar power generation and the likes. But most of the, you know, equipment, the batteries, most of them, you see most of the people we are dealing with saying they import it, they import it from China. So what are the bottlenecks that are limiting us in terms of making Nigeria or let's say African countries becoming industrial base for all these you know, battery component and blah, blah, blah. Why can't we be having such in Nigeria? That's just my question. Power. That's, that's why we're here. <laughs> the only major challenge we have in that, there's nothing that is done for during the rest of the world that is not being done, that we can't do. And that's why you see most of Africans, just like yourself and Colin and Biola, I see on the call, even Joma, everyone. That's why you are able to excel when you leave the shores of Africa, because there's nothing, the only thing that we lack is the platform. So, for example, in South Africa, there is uh, there are two solar manufacturing plants that even export. In South Africa, for example, also, you believe that Air Force One, American airplane, uh, South Africans have one of the patents in that plane. So, and for example, Tesla himself, Elon Musk, started from where? Started from South Africa. So it's not that we can't do it. The deposit, for example, I, I was with uh, one of the uh, advisors to Angela Marquez, the, the chancellor of Germany. And what this man told me specifically is Africa needs to rise because what do, do, what do they have in Germany? He was speaking to me in Germany about, they don't have resources, but they make the machines to refine what we have in Africa. The future of Africa or the future of the world depends on Africa in two reasons. We have the power in terms of young population. Two, we have the deposit for the rare metals. The rare metals is what it's used to make battery. You will see from the last year to four to the next future, if you know about it, you know lithium ion battery is the new oil. And like 90 or 95% of those things are found in Africa, all the rare metals. So if we have it, they still come down here to exploit it. So we have the resources. So once we have the uh, power available, then easily we are able to develop these things ourselves. We can do it. There's nothing stopping us. Like myself, it's my dream. Uh, the last seminar I have, I'm also saying it here. I'm looking for the opportunities. It's my dream to also start producing solar panel in Africa. But how do you compete with China? We understand those things because the government is supporting them. So it's not like you can wake up one day and start competing. Because if I make a solar panel and I'm selling it at, um, say, $500, and someone will import it with import fees and everything when it comes from China is $300. No matter how much you like me, you will think of your business, you will buy the one from China. So we we'll decide to do it. One suggestion I have is Uber, for example, is America. Why can't we have our own Uber? Facebook is from America. Why can't we have our own Facebook? In South Korea, they have Cow Cow Talk. They don't even deal with WhatsApp. As of 2015, when I was staying in Korea, they were using Cow Cow. It does everything that WhatsApp does. So why don't we have our own taxi fire? Why must we pay all our money back to Silicon Valley? So every money, every billionaire, all of them have their source from here in Africa. So like you said, but the time is here. We are, our eyes are open and we are... That's why I'm encouraging you and I'm encouraging as many people as I meet on the way. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a decision that we must save our continent. So we can, and we are working towards that. I'm sure your little contribution in your own field is also doing its part. So very soon, yes, we'll take over the world. Thanks. Hello. Hello.
See from my side, I'm done. Thank you, everyone, for the great engagement, and thank you, Dr. Toyosi, for um, hosting such an incredible webinar. Um, looking forward to engaging with everyone else in our upcoming webinars as well. Have a great evening, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.